I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the administrative law case, Vermont Yankee versus Natural Resource Defense Council, or NRDC. I have the full name of the case printed here on my slide. This is a 1978 US Supreme Court case about judicially mandated hearings in informal rulemaking. Now, for my students, there's two points I wanna make before we dive into this case. First, this is one of the most famous and important cases in all of administrative law, easily in the top 10. It's in almost every administrative law casebook and in a lot of the um, legislation and regulation casebooks. And so uh, this is one of the cases in the course that you should kind of recognize by name and know what the basic holding was and what the facts were about. The other kind of uh, um, point for my students is you should take a minute and look at the table of contents of your casebook and find the Vermont Yank Yankee case and look at what chapter it's in and what subsection it is, it's in, what the um, headings of its subsection is and get your bearings about where you're at in your course. This case, um, pay attention to where this course falls in the casebook it will help you understand the case is a little con pretty confusing to read through. It will help you understand what's going on and what you're looking for in the case. The case has elements that will harken back to other parts of your course and that can make it confusing. So I suggest you sort of see where it uh, situate it within the larger context of your case book and your course. Okay, so let's see what happens in Vermont Yankee. This is about a couple of nuclear power plants applying for operating permits and licenses. In the 1970s, they are located in New England. At the time of the Vermont Yankee case, the agency with the primary authority to license nuclear power plants was called the Atomic Energy Commission or AEC. The AEC has since been reconstituted and replaced by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or NRC and some of your case books or uh, other study aids may switch back and forth between AEC and NRC when they refer to this agency. The Vermont Yankee dispute, as I said, arose about the licensing proceedings for a couple of nuclear power plants. And our plaintiffs or petitioners here are the Natural Resource Defense Council. This is an environmental advocacy or, or activist group that uses litigation to advocate for environmental causes generally. And they, in opposing the granting of these licenses, they raise concerns about the environmental impacts of the uranium fuel cycle. In other words, the radioactive waste material that's produced by power plants. Now, as an aside, for my students, um, it's important to keep in the mind the background of this case we had a nuclear power plant accident in the United States in the early 1970s at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania or upstate New York. The, um, so the Three Mile Island power plant had, a, um, had an accident and there was a release of radiation. Um, fortunately, it was a, we didn't have many fatalities, but it was a close call and it really spooked the public about the dangers of nuclear power and nuclear power plants and really gave a lot of um, uh, force and impetus to the anti-nuclear movement in the, uh, in the environmentalist community. And so that was the con part of the concern here. The other thing to keep in mind is in the environmentalist community today, there's still a debate about whether um, nuclear power is a clean renewable energy source that we should be using instead of fossil fuels because it doesn't produce the same level of greenhouse gas emissions as power plants that use coal and oil and natural gas. And so the theory goes among some environmentalists that if we had switched as a nation to, or if all of the industrialized nations had switched to nuclear power in the 1970s, instead of continuing their dependence on fossil fuel as their primary energy source for not only electricity, but cars and trucks and so, so on, that we might not 
uh, it would have made a big difference for the climate change crisis that we now face um, worldwide. Um, I, I'm not going to solve this uh, debate here in this video, but you should be aware that there's an ongoing debate about uh, whether we should have switched or should still switch to nuclear power. So here we go. The NRDC said that the environmental impacts of the radioactive waste were significant enough that the commission should deny these permits and not approve these plants for operation. By the way, the plants were approved and they operated until uh, 2014 when they were finally um, shuttered. The, um, uh, the commission realized that this issue about the waste product was going to come up in every licensing proceeding for a new power plant. And so there's a lot of safety concerns, as you can imagine, with nuclear power plants. They are intensely regulated uh, by the federal government in great detail. And this is about only one component of that, which is the radioactive waste product um, that's produced when we use, uh, when we produce a nuclear energy. And um, and so what they had been doing was in every time there was a permit, a team of scientists would study the plant and figure out how much fuel it was going to use and how much spent fuel it would produce or radioactive waste and um, come up with a, a specific environmental impact for that plant and then develop, help the agency develop a um, disposal plan uh, to contain and dispose of the radioactive waste from that plant. Well, this takes a lot of time to do this on a case-by-case -case basis. As you can imagine, it's very expensive and time-consuming. And also there's a risk that we'll get non-uniform results in different regions of the countries when you have different teams kind of working on these permit processes. So the commission decided to um, not only to streamline things, but also to get a uniform result that they were going to stop having proceedings about the waste product part of these uh, plant approvals and make a universal rule, promulgate this um, with a table or a grid. Now, they followed a, a Administrative Procedure Act, Section 553, which is about informal rulemaking, also called notice and comment rulemaking. For my students, you may remember, this involves publishing a proposed rule in the Federal Register, allowing a period for public comments to be submitted in writing, and then publishing a final rule. There's also a formal rulemaking um, track uh, in the APA, but usually agencies don't have to follow that. So the agency here is on safe footing in terms of their enabling statute using notice and comment rulemaking and they complied with that. And in fact, they actually went above and beyond because even though 553 does not require it, they had oral testimony at public hearings and town halls and things like that. And they allowed interested parties like concerned neighbors or environmental groups to come and be heard and gave them a time uh, to give their own presentations and to talk. They could even bring a lawyer to, who would speak on their behalf to express either concerns about these power plants or opposition to nuclear power in general. And um, now, even though the commission um, uh, did this and had these hearings, they did not permit the people at the hearings to cross-examine agency officials. And so some of the lawyers for the environmental groups basically wanted to grill um, top agency officials at these hearings. I don't know if they were looking for information or they thought it would be um, a, a great way to humiliate public officials in front of everyone at these informal hearings. But the agency didn't allow it. And instead they would have, they would take questions, they would answer questions, they would ask each other um, questions and so forth at these hearings. And at the conclusion of the hearing, the agency released the transcript and then gave interested parties an, an additional month or 30 days to submit supplemental written statements. So I wanna make sure my students understand that it's not that these people didn't have an opportunity to be heard. They absolutely, they had an opportunity to, they, they were given a microphone and take, could take the floor and um, 
express their opinion, and they could follow up by submitting written statements. The only thing that they were denied the opportunity to do was cross-examine um, agency officials from the Atomic Energy Commission. After the hearings, the AEC promulgated their rule, and it consisted of a grid or table that permitted the agency to basically when they had a new application come in, they would fill in the numbers um, for that license applicant, like how much fuel it planned to consume, how big, essentially factors for how big of a power plant it was going to be. And the table would yield a numerical assessment that a team of scientists had already put together um, of the environmental impact. So a plant of a certain size will produce a certain amount of radioactive waste. And the commission had decided that that amount of radioactive waste has X amount of environmental impact, which then meant that you had to have a, a specific, a, a certain grade of containment and disposal plant. Um, please note that this is an inter a very interesting and important part of this case for precedent purposes. Agencies are allowed to promulgate rules um, in the form of a matrix or table or grid. In administrative law, we look at another case called Heckler v. Campbell about the Social Security Administration adopting a grid of medical vocational guidelines for um, uh, claimants for their disability program. And here we have the Atomic Energy Commission using a table or grid um, to make decisions about licensing nuclear power plants um, based on how much radioactive waste they were going to produce. And for my students, keep in mind that when agencies promulgate regulations, most often they kind of look like statutes, right? They have numbered sections and lettered subsections and so forth, and they're phrased in statutory type um, uh, verbiage but an agency can promulgate a regulation in the form of a matrix or, or table or grid, and that table will have the same force of law as a regulation that looks on the page more like a statute. Imp important in this case, the final rule incorporated the environmental impact of the uranium fuel cycle. In other words, the radioactive waste material and its quantification of that impact was much smaller than the NRDC thought was appropriate. Keep in mind, there's an underlying disagreement between the environmental groups and the government about how dangerous the radioactive waste from nuclear power plants will be. And hence, the NRDC brought suit alleging various substantive and procedural defects with the decision. And then it gets to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and we hit another wrinkle. The DC Circuit concluded th that the commission acted unlawfully. In other words, they sided with the environmental group, the NRDC. Its decision seemed to say that the commission's decision-making procedures were inadequate, specifically because there were there was no cross-examination of these government witnesses. They didn't allow um, the environmental groups to grill um, agency officials in public. The DC Circuit thought this was a serious problem and they have to do it. Now I wanna explain what's going on here with the DC Circuit, but before we do, just real quickly, the US Supreme Court unanimously reversed. They completely rejected the DC Circuit's approach and said they had improperly imposed procedural requirements beyond those contained in the APA. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, first of all, it's a unanimous decision so we don't have any, this isn't a 5-4 split between liberals and conservatives, even though this is about a somewhat controversial topic, nuclear power plants. Um, the, so that's the first thing is that we have a unanimous decision. Secondly, the circuit courts in the federal system in the 1970s had increasingly started imposing a, their own procedural requirements on agencies and rulemaking. You may remember that this was the same period that the courts were um, imposing uh, due process procedures for agency adjudications and kind of requiring more of agencies in that, the, that regard. And they kind of carried that over into agency rulemaking and started requiring that when agencies were making regulations, promulgating regulations about something that was politically controversial, like nuclear power plants, that they um, democratize the process by having more public hearings. And it was one thing after another, 
that essentially, even though the agency was complying with the APA, the courts were adding layers of procedural requirements kind of by judicial gloss um, on the agencies that they wanted them to follow when they promulgated regulations. And this, the reason Vermont Yankee is such an important case is the Supreme Court finally said, stop it to all the circuit courts that were doing this. And the DC circuit, which is the most important circuit for administrative law purposes, may have been the worst offender, right? So they had definitely been doing this and this was a serious kind of pushback or smackdown by the Supreme Court um, for what the DC Circuit had been doing to the agencies with rulemaking. Now, um, for some students who want to know, so what's the big takeaway or what should I be highlighting in my casebook? The Supreme Court unanimously held that courts cannot add additional procedural requirements that go beyond the Constitution, the APA, and other enabling uh, statute requirements or regulatory procedural requirements. In other words, um, if as long as the agency is complying with the Constitution and satisfying the requirements of the Congress set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act, and remember, Congress can require more than the APA for specific agencies in their enabling statute. As long as the agency is following the statute, the courts have to leave them alone about it. Also keep in mind that the agency, as in this case, is free to do something extra, right? To add, have some extra procedures if they want, um, to, they know they're doing something controversial and want more transparency. So they can do that, but the courts can't intervene and require them this of them. Um, some scholars, uh, law scholars, think of Vermont Yankee as kind of the administrative law equivalent of Erie v. Tompkins in civil procedure. In other words, there's no federal common law of administrative procedure. Courts can't say, you have to use this specific procedure, like cross-examination. Um, in other words, we're not going to generate procedural requirements for rulemaking by precedent that has to be done by statute. So Vermont Yankee, in a sense, reads the Administrative Procedure Act as mandating the minimum procedures required of agencies. In other words, an agency is not allowed to do less than required by the APA, but they're free to do more if they want. At the same time, it's the maximum that courts can mandate. So a court can't come, on, uh, come along and say, you know, this agency deals with dangerous things, and there's a whole bunch of people in this country that don't agree with what this agency is doing, so we, the court are going to make this agency um, go through some extra hoops in their process. You can't do that. The APA is the maximum that the courts are allowed to hold agencies to when it comes to rulemaking procedure. This interpretation keeps judicial review or procedural error more predictable and universal and avoids pushing agencies towards time-consuming adjudication, right? We, um, where Congress has already said what they want agencies to do and has authorized informal decision-making. And he, again, this is very important. In the court's view, agencies are entitled to discretion about whether to base rules on a formal record unless this is required by Congress. What are we saying here? Um, in the years before Vermont Yankee, the circuit courts in the federal system were requiring more and more and essentially pushing the agencies to have their informal rulemaking look more and more like formal rulemaking, those elaborate trial-like procedures that we rarely use. Now, Congress, for some agencies, requires that they follow formal rulemaking when they promulgate regulations. But the courts were trying to make other agencies do something that looks like that even when Congress hasn't required it and the court says they can't do that. Okay, here's a review question to make sure you've been paying attention. The Vermont Yan Yankee case pertains to which of the following? It's about the non-delegation doctrine and Congress's power to delegate rulemaking to agencies, A, or B, is it about the authority of the president to appoint acting directors to fill vacancies in the cabinet? C, is Vermont Yankee about an agency's authority to adopt its own rulemaking procedures and rulemaking hearings um, beyond those required under the APA? Or D, is this case about the timing of a due process hearing when a government employee is fired? Now, this is supposed to be an easy um, 
question. And if you're not sure, you really should go back and rewatch the video. Okay, that concludes our lecture about the Vermont Yankee versus NRDC case.